We talk about thousand suns today. We're going to cover the community guidelines, units. You know what works, what doesn't. Put some recommendations in there, and then we're going to cover the fact that if you follow the community guidelines, they're a really boring side. So let's not follow the community guidelines too closely. Now the community guidelines is a competitive list. It basically involves around demon princes, Rubik marines, and Zangos, and you get other units to support them. Now the demon princes are effective, but they're just gigantic bullet magnets. People are going to kill them first because they think they're the biggest threat. Tip: They're not, <laughs> right? But they, they, you know, they are quite expensive. But they're cheaper than the tank with laser cannons. Tip here, right? Tanks and thousand suns, not the best combination. You think they would be, but they're not. So if you take tanks, you take them just to mix up the game to make it interesting. Not because they're going to be better at anything, because they're not. So um, anyhow, Demon Princes, they're your cannon fodder units. 180 points worth of cannon fodder. People are going to shoot them, they're going to kill them. And when they die, if that's what you're relying on, that's your game over. Luckily for you, they're not the best unit. <clears throat> Rubik Marines. They're one of your best units. They're basically a walking, talking, five wound sorcerer that can fire in a five man squad, seven bolt gun shots at AP minus two, and carries a warp plumer as a backup. Oh, yeah, and he casts spells. What power, psychic powers. And he does it for 103 points. That is one of your best units. They can take out tanks. All you've got to do is hit and get a five plus. And they've got a minus two save to make. It's worked, I've done it. You can cause wounds on pretty much anything with um, Rubik Marines. And um, Space Marine players hate you. Because <laughs> they start to feel what it's like to be an Imperial Guard unit with a five plus save. The Bolt of Discipline rule applies to Rubik Marines too. So you stand them still, you gain from that. Now, um, the other you well, the other reason for taking uh, Rubik's is they get all his dust. That's a plus one on their save and their vulnerable save against you know weapons that cause one damage, and that means you're going to be saving on two plus against most rifle weapons, including bolt guns and laser guns and stuff like that. And if you put them in cover, even a heavy bolter would be a two plus save. Now um, the other unit that is also equally one of your best units are Zangors. Basically they're Space Marines but for close combat and a really crappy save. But they also get um, an invulnerable save of 5 plus which can be buffed using whatever. So you know, um, Gaze of Fate, is it? Or weave, not Gaze of Fate, Weaver of Fate, so something anyway. There's a, there's a, there's a power that you can cast on them um, and make them a 4 plus invulnerable which is awesome. Now these guys here, you, if you match them across the board as a big blob, because you need to use them as a blob really to get the maximum effect off of them, says the uh, I'll get shot up. So what we do with them is we put them in in the what they call the warp or the webway. Says and we webway infiltrate them on turn two, which means any supporting unit that isn't an infantry unit can't be up there with them. They have to march across the board to get to them in order to support them, which is the problem. But to be honest, they do quite well without support. But you really should include a shaman to buff them if you're going to do that. Shamans are on disc, they can move quickly, they can get across the board into position in a couple of turns. No problems whatsoever. Uh, you just don't want to get them shot in the meantime. And they will give your, your Zangors a 2 plus to hit. Plus, they can cast a full smite as a bonus, or they can buff up the Zangors and give them that 4 plus invulnerable. See, so they're pretty good. Now that will all support the community, you know, idea of Thousand, thousand Sun's side. The uh, Zango Shaman is just something I added, but I think most people would add that for the same reason. The Zango Shaman would also buff Enlightened, Zango Enlightened, which are basically 12 inch moving heavy bolters on disc. Short range heavy bolters on disc, about 12 inches. So you imagine a heavy bolt that can move 12 inches, fire without penalty. Shaman can do the same thing, he gives them a plus one to hit. They're hitting on a two plus with a short range heavy bolter. They are devastating. Right? But that's not one of the community recommendations. 
but a lot of people like them and a lot of people we recommend taking them and I recommend taking at least six of those as an optional add-on for your army to spice up your game players. You swap things out. Maybe take them instead of an extra squad of Rubik Marines, that kind of thing. Because they're very, very cheap. Cannon fodder in fact. The other thing I recommend is um, the, uh, the uh, Mutalif Vortex Beast. People say, oh, it's crap, it'll die on first turn. No, it doesn't. Right. Unless you stick it in front of a laser cannon and say, kill me, which in case they will, it doesn't die on turn one, it's just a load of nonsense. And so anyhow, the Vortex Beast beams in, well, it walks in, just the same as everybody else, walks all the way to the Zangos, eight inches of turn. So it's a bit slow, a bit risky. However, you can get him there because he's more re he's more resilient than you might think. He can take a few hits and survive, and he heals one wound a turn. Plus, if he gets within nine inches, he can do one of his powers, warp flare, I think it's called, cause one mortal wound to every enemy within nine inches. So you will find yourself looking for the biggest clump of enemy and just charging him in there like a bull. In fact, I should have called him a red bull. <laughs> you know, he doesn't have wings, but he really does mess things up also you've got a situation where you've got to choose between one of his two attacks one of them you'll get four attacks but it basically it's an ap2 weapon you get a bit of a bonuses here and there or you can go for the standard one i think it's bectan bectan more i can't pronounce it but basically it's a user strength which in this case is seven one damage minus one you get 12 attacks with that now whilst this means it's more or less anti-infantry he does do quite well against vehicles as well. Two or three, maybe in four wounds. Not unusual for the uh, Vortex Beast. So uh, he will eat his way to the Zangors through infantry, vehicles alike. And it, he will just use his powers and just slaughter anything in his way. Very, very good unit, worth taking. Ignore the naysayers. Again, right, if you wanted to mix up your Thousand Sons army, Taking a Vortex Beast, a Zango mob, and a Shaman, and just making that one particular strategy in your whole army, and use the tactics together to buff the Zangos, you would see a different style of gameplay to them than if you just took Zangos and, um, and Rubik Marines and Demon Princes. It would change your game quite considerably. As would removing the Zangos. And then putting the uh, Zango Enlightened in there instead. Same thing, mix it up. Now let's talk about non-community guideline units. Things you can add to the basic force the community recommends and use to mix up your game a little bit. We'll start with Zango Enlightened um, and their differences. First of all, you get two weapon options. The weapon options, the um, everybody takes, it's the same one, it's the bow. If I can find it here. Fate caster bow. This thing here is an assault two weapon, so you get two shots with it. But you get three in a squad, usually, so that's six shots. And uh, it's a minus one, one damage weapon. So it's a, it's, this is why I call it a short range heavy bolter, because it basically is a short range heavy bolter, but it's not a heavy weapon. So you can move and fire without issue. And this gives it a bonus. Now these hit on a free plus usually. But when the Zango Shaman's nearby, all Zango get a plus one to hit. So if you're going to run Zangos and Zango Enlightened, you can either keep them together with a Shaman or field two Shamans, one for each squad, in order to make both of them hit on a two plus. That's a strategy on its own right, that just there. In fact, um, we'll go into the shamans a bit later, but remember, that's an extra smite each for every single shaman you take. Next, Zangors. Zangors come with either auto pistols and blades by default, or the Zangor blades. Nearly everybody goes for the Zangor blades. And I think that's one of the reasons why the um, plastic sprue that used to give you the pistols for the Zangos isn't in the box anymore because people didn't use it. So uh, anyhow, Zangos are purely melee. So the only reason why you take them is melee. You get them in there. They're, they're like 
They're like the Thousand Sons version of Corn Berserkers, only to be honest, I would take them rather than the Berserkers every time. I just like them. Um, you also had a bit of colour to your army, I think. So, so these, these are the two main things to focus on when you're thinking about Zangos and the, the way they interact. Now we're going to look at the next important issue. The, the issue that isn't a community guideline but everybody has their own opinion on. We're going to talk about demon princes, all the sorcerers and the shamans together. Now as, when I said at the beginning that tanks are a good combination with a thousand sons, it's because thousand sons do have a far better way of dealing with things. Although it's more like a flea bite than a hammer. It's a mortal wound, a smite mortal wound or a power mortal wound. Powers, not smite has to be against the closest target, but there are some powers, let's see if I can find one, in here, where you can target any unit you like and try and get a mortal wound on it. And that includes characters. I think Doombolt is one such power. I can't remember. Um, Doombolt, yeah, what chairs now? Uh, select an enemy unit that's within 18, inch, 18 inches and visible to the Psyker. That unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, but that's a warp charge value of 9. That's probably a 1 for Aram and that. But there are others. There are, there are various other powers here. Now, remember when you were um, picking out Psykers, that Thousand Sun Psykers generally you know the exalted sorcerers and sorcerers and the shamans generally only have the discipline of change and the discipline of uh dark her hereticus <laughs> dark heretic the other one <laughs> i can say that normally but for some reason i can't say it now but they only get to choose from those two if you want to use the discipline of zeech you need a demon prince now here's a reason for taking a demon prince beyond the fact they're good and that is um, Gaze of Fate. Gaze of Fate has a warp charge value of 6, so it's easy to get off. Um, if manifested, you can reroll a single dice later during your turn. One of the things a Thousand Suns player does a lot is reroll dice. Stratagems are good, but you'll find yourself spending your command points rerolling dice, right? So that strategy will save you a lot of command points, or rather that power. So that's one of the powers you should give to a demon prince, just so you could get that, that roll back. Now we're going to talk about points and HQ choices and sorcerers, because it's all related. With a thousand sons, a sorcerer and an HQ choice tends to be the same thing. A thousand sons strength comes from its powers, right? So that's what you wanted to stock up on. If you were playing Iron Warriors, you'd be fielding tanks and siege equipment. But in Thousand Suns, you're playing a psychic heavy army, so you want psychers, 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 more psychers. Put your faith in psychers. Now, demon princes, some people take them with um, uh, the malefic talons for taking on the infantry. You've got the vortex beast for that. He'll do exactly the same job. In fact, let's have a quick look at the um, warp talons, shall we? Um, the demon princes and the warp talons. It's the warp talons, isn't it? No, malefic talons, sorry. What am I saying warp talons for? Delip malefic talons, right. These are basically user strength, which is seven, AP minus two, and two damage. A bit stronger than the um, than the Vortex Beast. Uh, and you get uh, one additional attack, or three if you take two with each, with these instead. So, uh, So basically that knocks your attacks up to 7. So if you take a set of them, you get 7 attacks with your Demon Prince. The, what, the Vortex Beast gets 12. Mm. Although his is 1 damage and minus 1 AP. But the point is the Vortex Beast, better option if you're going for infantry than that. This guy here, give him a Demonic Axe, right? It's a plus one strength, that's eight. It'd be, it'd be damaging a land, well, a wounded land raider on a four plus, right? Minus three save, land raiders or stuff, that, that, that'll make it difficult to save. Free damage, right? Use it for destroying tanks. Take out the big stuff with your demon princes. 
let your Zangos deal with the infantry because they can deal with that. If you take a demon prince and Zangos you, and then you give them malefic talent, you're basically doubling up on the same job. You don't need to double up on the same job if you're fielding a blob of Zangos. The Zangos will do the job, trust them. And if you don't think they can, stick a mutilated beast in there as well. A mutilated vortex beast, should I say. And let him help out. I'll cover him in a minute because he's a good one in his own right. But anyhow, Demon Prince anyhow. Suppliers of Gears of Fate. Another smite on the board important. A threatening unit that will attract fire. Which is what you want as an army. You don't play an army going, Oh, I'm scared someone might shoot at me. You field an army and go, shoot at something. If you kill him, he's going to kill you. That's what you do. Be aggressive. Anyway, the, um, the Demon Princes are good. But don't make the mistake of going overboard. Take them in balance with the rest of your army. And remember what other parts of your army and what jobs they're doing. Because you don't want to double up on the same job, right? You know, take different units for different roles. That way you've got a balanced army. Even though it doesn't look balanced, it will be balanced. Demon Princes, anti-tank. Think of it that way. Now they're 180 points, so you can't take too many of them. They're very, very expensive, right, for what they are. And uh, the Exalted Sorcerers, they're on disc, they're 154. And um, Exalted Sorcerers on foot, that's 129. That's three of your HQ choices. If you go down to the Sorcerers, right, normal Sorcerers, they're 110. Sorcerers for 110 points, they're a lot cheaper, 70 points cheaper than a Demon Prince. Now you have to take HQ choices for a detachment, so you have to take some of them. You've got no choice. But you can see, you can save an awful lot of points by going for a Sorcerer rather than a Demon Prince. Now let's just check on something here, because uh, I haven't got one of these, but I intend to. Uh, do, 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 do. Mm. No, it's been the named characters. Yeah, Araman on disc, 166 points. Versus Araman on foot, 131 points. Araman's a good unit to tech regardless, right? He gets a plus one to cast his psychic power, so you could pick the stronger powers because you know he has a better chance of getting them off, right? So there's, that's the reason for taking Araman. He gets free powers, denies three times, and he can cast some of the stronger powers. But like I said, he only gets to choose from two disciplines. So he's like all the rest of them, whereas um, Demon Princes, they can pick from three disciplines. Which, if you like the Zeech powers, you need to take a Demon Prince. Um, yeah, two powers, just check him. <coughs> Not two powers, two disciplines. Now, um, going back to the points. With the Thousand Sons being a smite heavy game, you want to take Psychus. That's a definite plus. And because detachments need HQ choices to head each detachment, it's going to eat into your points quite badly. But you could take an awful lot of cheap infantry in the form of Zangos, get the command point count up, and then ruin it all by taking three Zang or two Demon Princes for 360 points. But for 220 points, you could uh, take the Sorcerers. You see, the Sorcerers with their four swords would give you your minimum requirement for the HQ choices and deliver another two smites on the board for you, which is what you want. Um, the Rubik Marines all come with a baby smite. Every single squad of them with another baby smite. That counts toward your total. And if you're going to build an army, focus on building up your collection of HQ choices. Because if you need to save points, swapping out a Demon Prince for a Sorcerer is a good way of saving 70 points. And swapping out an, um, an Exalted Sorcerer for a Sorcerer or an Exalted Sorcerer on foot, again, will save you a lot of points. Right? This kind of flexibility allows you to... You know, take units you might not want to take. You see, so it's important to get that collection of HQ choices available along with your army. You won't field them all at once, but when you need to squeeze in a predator or something else or a, a mutilative beast, you can. You can just swap an HQ choice around and you've got the points to do it. The other thing that isn't an HQ choice but is a character and also delivers smite is the Zangor Shaman. 
Now as Angle Sherman, if I just get the points up, uh, I moved it all the way down, didn't I? The Zango Shaman is a lot cheaper, it's the cheapest, it's the cheapest way of delivering smite of any kind. This is, uh, here he goes, 87 points. Two of them, right, are about, was it, uh, 174, about the same price as Araman, 10 points, 10 points more. But that's two smites. Let's think about that for a second, right? You could take, right, three Zango Shamans and get three smites from it. So it's for a lot cheaper than taking a sorcerer, exalted sorcerer, or a demon prince, or you know, three of each. See, so if you want to get smites, the cheapest way of doing it, three Zango Shamans. That'll buff your thing up, but it's fast as well. Anything on disc or with wings is going to be like a, a rapidly moving assassin. Someone says, I've got a Vindicator assassin, you say, I've got a mortal wound machine on disc. Do I look impressed? So anyhow, shamans, very good. Remember, they buff the Zangos as well as being a source of smite. And that's the key. Now, um, whilst I love Chaos Terminators, because the way you can equip them makes them deadly, you can beam them in, lay waste to the enemy's back line for two turns before they start suffering. I'm not so keen on the Scarabs. The Scarabs... Well, you think, if you think about it as a scarab is a kind of um, a sorcerer with so many lives, just like the just like the, um, the Rubik's, the price, you see the Rubik's are a cheap plus two save against most weapons. You don't really get the same benefit from um, a two plus save scarab terminator. So the jury's still out on that. Magnus, some people like Magnus. I don't like the model, so I haven't got the model. But it gives all kinds of bonuses. As as a rule, as a set of rules, Magnus is alright. Price wise, it's that is a bit of a liability, and some people see him die on turn one a lot. Other people say if you protect him, but then if you're gonna protect him, you basically your whole arm is there to save Magnus and to make him safe. You could just leave him at home, he'd be nice and safe there. You take something that is less likely to die quickly. Uh, so I'm I've got mixed feelings about Magnus. I, I went for the Fate Weaver instead. Um, basically, he's just a bigger demon prince that can be shot at because he's got more than 10 wounds. But he's one of the best psychers in the game. And for a Thousand Sons army, that's a good choice. But he'd have to be fielded as demon allies. But if I fielded him, he could take Gears of Fates instead of the demon princes. Because he's a Zeech demon. Anyway, so then, moving on. The Mutilith Vortex Beast. The community is completely divided on this one. And I can tell you now for a fact they're all wrong. <laughs> well, the ones that disagree with me are wrong. I'm right, they're wrong. <laughs> now seriously though, right? Um, the community is divided on it. But a lot of these competitive types do this um, not optimal, um, will die on turn one routine. What is optimal, right? I mean, you could a knight is a knight optimal for taking an objective that's stuck on the first floor of a building? Is he seriously? Twenty-four percent or twenty-five percent of all armies are knight armies. They're supposed to be optimal. How good are they going to be in that situation? They can't get in the building, so they can't claim the objective. So they're useless, are they? So they're not optimal. Get my point? Vortex beasts. The vortex beasts are uh, basically like mutual. Um, Mauler fiends, except for they've got powers that can buff units around them. So there's especially Zeech units. They can the key word literally is Zeech. I'll read you a couple out just so you get an idea. Right? So these are basically anti-infantry Mauler fiends with psychic powers, which go off in the shooting phase. So they're not psychic powers as such, but they are psychic powers. Now here look, he's got the uh, Chaos Infusion applies to Zeech armies. Uh, temporal flux applies to each armies. The ethereal touch applies to each each request. It's each keyword, right? Which means this will work on demons as well. If you take demon allies, that will work because they've got the each keyword as well, right? So this will work on thousand suns, um, zangos. You know, you basically this adds, this is applies to something I'll talk about in a minute about you know spicing up your thousand suns. Uh, but this guy here is his primary attack, the uh, 
botan uh, botanical moor, I think that's how you pronounce it. That's the one where you get 12 attacks per you know per combat phase with that. And um, I think there's a stratagem as well for this guy. Uh, but it's a user strength, minus one, um, one damage attack. The other one is enormous claws, which is a user strength, AP minus two, two damage. But I don't use that one, I use the 12. I found with the 12 attacks, I usually get three or four wounds on a vehicle, which is his weak side. Right, that's he's, he's weaker against vehicles, but I used to get three or four wolves on a vehicle, and I usually get uh, quite a lot of kills against infantry. This guy here, he's got to walk, remember, to meet the Zangars, but he's not going to be useless during that walk. He's going to lay a swath of blood on the way to his destination, and he's also 125 points. If they kill him, you haven't lost an awful lot. He does more damage than a Hellbrute, and people love Hellbrutes. By the way, I haven't mentioned health boots in this because whilst they are good, dreadnoughts are always good because they can. They, if, if you want to go on the attack, dreadnoughts are brilliant. You want someone attacking you, dreadnoughts are brilliant. Anything in between, you want a flexibility, dreadnoughts are brilliant. Health boots are dreadnoughts. They, they're just good in all situations. But um, for a psychic heavy army, if you want to go for something different, you can leave the health boots at home. But as a general rule, Regardless of what army you're taking, I would always take three dreadnoughts, three of the more flexible dreadnoughts, not the big expensive ones like the Primaris ones you get, although they are nice. But three, three Hellbrooks, all games if I had the choice. In my Renegade army, I run Hellbrooks all the time, but I want it to be different from my Thousand Sons army, if you understand. But anyhow, the Maul of Feet, the, the Mutilif Vortex Beast, he can walk forward assault things and if he gets within nine inches of an enemy and this is why you'll charge him into the middle of the many as many enemies as you can you can uh, on a two plus from his vortex power you could uh, cause one mortal wound to every single enemy within nine inches so if you get him into the middle of the enemy lines that's a mot free mortal wound on everything that's good you know that's like that's as one baby smite for every unit within range pretty much just on a two plus roll so he's worth taking, and the fact that he buffs up other units, like he can reduce the leadership of the enemies, he could uh, increase the strength of friends and increase the AP value by one of friendly units. So uh, the Zangor blades go from AP minus one to AP minus two. Lethal, dangerous. You attacking somebody with a good save, give him that, give them Zangors that power, and just watch them be decimated. Very good unit, very cheap unit, well worth taking, never leave it at home. Now, let's talk about Zango Shamans. Zango Shamans, two Zango Shamans are cheaper than one Demon Prince. So if you wanted to replace two Demon Princes with two Zango Shamans, you're pretty much going to have almost the points needed to take a Predator for free. It's like going down to the supermarket and saying, buy one Zango Shaman, get another one for free, and there's a demon, is is a predator, you know, thrown in as a bonus. So if you wanted to get this, if you're getting units for smites, you could go the Zango Shaman route and still take a tank. Not that I'm recommending a tank, but you've got that option. Whereas the people say demon princes are the way to go. You don't get a free predator with a demon prince, but you could with two shamans if you replace the demon princes with shamans. So think about it, right? This is the flexibility that you don't see in the community recommendations. You can still get the Demon Prince, you know, smites off with the Shamans, but you wouldn't get the other benefits, obviously. But you could get a Predator, you could get anything for 200 points. You could get another two, well, you couldn't take another two Shamans because you're only allowed three. But you could take, um, say, a Sorcerer, that'd be three smites. There's a number of things you could do anyway, you know, or two Sorcerers. <laughs> so you could get four smites for the price of two, just by going down the list, you know, and getting cheaper, cheaper Sakers. Now, um, regarding, regarding the, how the armies work, you, you meet and two veg in any Thousand Sons armies, your Rubik Marines and your Zangors, but your Zangors can be swapped out for other things. I don't think your Rubik Marines ever should be. Your, your Rubik Marines should always be your main primary unit on the board and they're the most survivable you can put them in harm's way and they will take an awful lot of hits 
they'll take the kind of hits that would make a tactical marine blush you know that they, they just you'd wipe out a tactical marine squad in no time assault marines would die trying to take these guys out and you, you, they basically they'd be just like two plus two plus two plus you know, is that the best you could do you know two plus save two plus save and then your aspiring sauce would turn around and go right my turn dead 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 trouble is they're a bit they're a bit vulnerable to um characters like chapel chaplains anything with a close combat weapon that's a high strength and four with a ap fairly high and um damage more than one they can chew through rubik marines just like butter right so you want to keep the characters away from them if you see a character coming and you see a bunch of uh, assault marines shoot the character leave the assault marines so you know, but they're your back line usually. You can drop them on objectives to defend objectives, they're good at that. But they're not your rapidly moving forces, they're your back line. The Zangors, you beam them in, they're part of your main assault force. You spread them across the front line. So when they do attack, they attack everybody in the background, tie up the whole back line all at the same time. If you've got the um, Shaman nearby, they'll be hitting on a 2 plus. If you've got the Mutilator Beast or Mutilift Beast, the Vortex Beast next nearby, you'd be sure you'd have a choice of things. You could just go with a mortal wound on all local enemies or near, nearby enemies, or you could give them um, an AP minus an AP minus 2 weapon, or even increase their strength to 5. So there's all kinds of options you've got there. It says, and then you've got spawn. Again, community guidelines say, ah, oh, these crap. No. What they are is very hard to kill off. They've got a lot of wounds. Well, they've got a decent amount of wounds. So they don't, they don't die after one shot. They're quite quick. All they do is get into combat. If I wanted to charge a Tau army with anything, I'd charge it with a spawn first, or a rhino, <laughs> but um, I'd charge it with a spawn because the spawn can take the hits and once in combat they can't shoot at the next guy coming in. So they're really good and they're quite cheap as well, so don't rule out spawn. Spawn on their own can be a really good distraction, like a mini demon prince bullet magnet. People might even ignore them until they get into combat. I also, even though the rolls aren't that brilliant in combat for um, a spawn, they do surprisingly well. I have yet to play a game with spawn where the spawn didn't do good. Right? I mean, they've always delivered the goods. They've always made their points back. Point for point, spawns are worth it. I'm not talking about taking three and two dying and the other one doing okay so they're crap. That other one that survives usually makes up for the two that didn't. Plus you get all kinds of stuff, if you save points back you can use a power that turns an enemy into a spawn if he dies. That can be fun, you know, you think the Orcs have really got a monopoly on the fun, they haven't. Bows and Sons are quite capable of delivering that fun as well. So remember all these options can be added, mixed in or changed the community guideline force. And some people who want to play a competitive armies can go and play that boring community force a community guidelines force if they like over and over and over and over and over and over again until they're just manually boring or you can try some of the ideas I've thrown out at you here and the ideas I've thrown out at you here will change your game and make your army exciting final tip for those people who are um, collecting new armies always start with the basic troops Learn to paint your army using the basic troops when you've got an awful lot of models to practice on. Right, do it one squad at a time. If you need to strip them, just stick them in detail or whatever you use for half an hour. Polish it off or scrub it off with a toothbrush. Do it again. It might seem a bit bad doing it with 10 models instead of one, but nobody pays much attention to your basic troops. It's your commanders and your HQ choices they think should be looking good. So they're the ones you've got to get it right on and you can't get it right on them until you've mastered the colour scheme you've chosen. And the best way to do that is repetition. And the repetition part comes from painting basic troops. Plus you need more basic troops than anything else. And a lot of people start an army going, I'll get Magnus or I'll get a big knight because it's a cheap way of just getting up to 2,000 points. But it's not the best way of getting up to 2,000 points. The best way of getting up to 2,000 points is by buying six troops first. That's six troop units first. 
I as a rule always buy six troop units, one for each objective that might come up and then I decide whether I want to take all six or not. That gives me some flexibility immediately. In the case of the Thousand Sons, you already know Rubik Marines are your best unit. So that's a good option. From there you need to go for HQs because you can't play really a detachment without HQs. And that's up to you. You know, it's whatever your preference is. Once you've got your six units and your two HQs, you've got yourself a battalion. And you can take anything you like after that. You just take it in the direction of Zangors, take it in the direction of demon support, anything you like. And on the topic of um, demon allies, remember they're Zeech, keyword Zeech. Anything with a keyword Zeech can sometimes use or benefit from powers in the Thousand Sons book and vice versa. You know, demon things might work for Thousand Sons as well. But remember, demon Zeech and Zeech, two different keywords. So you can't um, combine the two if it's demon Zeech. It's got to be Zeech, just Zeech, keyword Zeech. So uh, there's benefits there. But if you were to sort of leave your Zangors at home when you're playing, you could use your demon allies, your Zeech demon allies, as a way of replacing the Zangors, taking flamers and you know um, horrors and stuff like that instead. It got screeches, I think they're called as well. They're quite good actually. So you've got options. You can really mix it up a bit by taking demon allies. But it's the Rubik Marines I found are your core unit, the important thing to get right. So go for a three at first or six if you can, pick them up, a couple of eight cubes, and then uh, just build it up over time. Don't think I'm gonna do six of these and that's my army. Keep buying the little bits here and there for your army. The more you get, the more flexibility you've got and the better your army's going to be and the more interesting it's going to be. You're going to be able to mix things up and if, even if you play the same person over and over again from week to week, he's never going to know exactly which way your army's going to play if you only take Demon Princes occasionally. You'll never be able to plan for it. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed the video. Leave comments below. And remember, everything's an opinion. Your opinion's as valid as mine. If you've got one, leave it.